Hi flower friends, it's Nicole from Flower Hill Farm and I am growing cut flowers for sale in upstate New York, zone 4B. It's fantastic. I'm wearing, this is Veda's Flower Hill Farm hoodie today and uh, I got it out of the dryer, so it's mine today. So anyway, today is something that I've been thinking about for a while now and that is some of the biggest mistakes that I made flower farming in 2020 and I hesitate them. Whoops. <laughs> I don't hesitate them. I hesitate to call them mistakes because in reality, they were lessons learned. A lot of those mistakes turned into future successes, although it might not have seemed like that at the time, it eventually turned into something where I was able to find a solution and then found something that worked for me on the farm. So, drum roll please. My first biggest lesson learned of 2020 was not having a cooler. And I learned that lesson early on because you know what? I planted thousands of tulips. So this is something that I actually was warned about by more than one person. Number one being Dave Dowling. I took a course on perennials with him where he talks in depth about growing tulips and how not to grow them unless you have a cooler. <laughs> tulips and lilies. Those were two things I was warned about. Guess what I grew a lot of this year? Tulips and lilies. Guess what I don't have? A cooler. So I ended up using an extra refrigerator that we have here. And when I say I used it, I used it. I took the drawers out, I moved the shelves around. There was absolutely nothing in this refrigerator except for flowers. So one of the lessons that I learned too with this cooler situation is I grew two chunks of, of tulips, 500 each of the same variety. Guess what? they're gonna have the same bloom time. So I had 500 parrot tulips coming into harvest, and then a few weeks later, I had 500 queen of the night tulips coming to harvest all at the same time. I didn't have an outlet for that, those flowers. Not having a cooler is actually when I started to harvest the tulips with the bulb because they will store for much longer if you harvest them with the bulb. Tulips in the flower farming industry are considered annuals. Once you cut them, they are not guaranteed to have a bloom or a strong bloom in the years that follow. So usually those bulbs are taken out and fresh ones are put in. Harvesting it with the bulb meant that I was able to store those tulips in my refrigerator for up to three weeks this year successfully. That's when I sold my very last bunch, was about three weeks after I had harvested them all, which was fantastic. Now, I'm holding them in buckets in the fridge without water, just the bulb in five gallon buckets or whatever buckets I could get to fit in this fridge. Now, when you take them out of the refrigerator, they do look a little limp and a little bit weak necked. Some people actually store them in tall boxes to protect the necks. When you take them out, give them a fresh scrim, put them in some water, within about two hours, they were ready to go. The lilies that I grew, about 750 of them this year, I succession planted them. Now that was because I wanted to extend my harvest, have fresh blooms week after week after week. So every week I planted another 100 or so of those lilies. So, because we had an extraordinarily dry and hot summer, those lilies took on a mind of their own and started to bloom super fast. I couldn't keep up with harvest. So because they were all blooming at the same time, I had to do something. I even posted on the Flower Farmers Facebook page, remember when Dave said not to grow lilies if you don't have a cooler? <laughs> Guess what I did? So anyway, that led me to have my first pop-up porch sale. That was not something that was in the cards for me. I had not anticipated selling any flowers from my property this year. And that pop-up porch sale was an amazing success. <laughs> And that pop-up porch sale was an amazing success for me. I loved it for many reasons, and let me tell you. Opening up the farm and not having to pack my car full of flowers and drive them somewhere was a godsend. It was also a nice distraction during COVID. People wanted to be outdoors. They wanted to be doing things. Everything was shut down. There was no movie theater. There were no organized sports. People were looking for something to do. So to come to my porch sale and pick out a bouquet that was something refreshing and something that people were enjoying doing. And I loved it because I was able to meet face-to-face, -face, although masked, with my customers. Even so, I would have been able to hold these lilies much longer and extended the selling season if I had a cooler. So my solution, buy a cooler. <laughs> I have not done this yet. I have been looking on Craigslist and the Facebook marketplace, looking for a used cooler because I'm not ready to invest in a new cooler yet. I'd like to build 
a workshop type area where I have a large walk-in cooler. I'm just not there yet. So right now I'm using refrigerators and I'm looking for another large refrigerator or maybe even a three door cooler, like a Pepsi cooler or something like that. But that's my solution is I need to buy a cooler and I'm gonna need to do so soon. So my issue with my lilies brings me to my learning curve number two. I will call it succession planting. Oops. So here are some of the lessons that I learned this year from succession planting. I was very aggressive with it. I planted hundreds of gladiolas and lilies every single week so that I could extend my season. But who knows if this was just a fluke because of the hot and dry season that I had, but they all started blooming at once and I couldn't do anything about it. Like I said, I didn't have enough room in the cooler with the lilies and with the glads, fortunately, I had a market for those for sure. I had buckets and buckets of my glads and my lilies. Fortunately, I was able to sell some wholesale, not as many as I liked, but they were a huge hit at my porch sale and my bouquet bar. So my solution here to my succession planting problem is to spread out my plantings just a little bit. I did them weekly in 2020. In 2021, I'm going to do them about every 10 days. We'll see how that goes. Okay, so you heard me say bouquet bar. If you're new here and you're wondering what that is all about, it's something that was actually born from one of my biggest mistakes, and that was how I did my CSAs this year. So a CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. The idea behind this is that customers pay in advance to the farmer for a certain amount of products for the upcoming season. It's a way for the farmers to get ahead financially on the season. They are usually weekly pickups of products. Mine is $100 for five bouquets throughout the season. I have a detailed video all about my CSAs. If you wanna learn more about that, I'll link that here. So I gave the option to my CSA members to skip weeks. Now they could do that if they were out of town, if they were going camping, or if they just didn't like the flowers that they were offered that week, whatever reason. And they had the option to do that from May all the way until first frost. I didn't put any sort of a time cap on the CSA membership. That was mistake numero uno. I allowed them to skip however many weeks they wanted. And a lot of people were skipping multiple weeks in a row because they were looking forward to the flowers that come later in the season, like the dahlias, the zinnias, and the sunflowers. And that prevented me from selling a second set of CSAs, which I had planned on doing. I had a waiting list of over 40 people who wanted to get on my CSA list. And to put that in perspective, I was only doing 18 CSAs at a time. So any given week, I had to be prepared with enough flowers to make 18 bouquets. And I didn't know if a customer was going to skip until the night before. They had until Thursday evening to let me know if they wanted those flowers or not. So oftentimes I would have harvested enough flowers to do 18 bouquets the next morning and say 12 of my members would skip that week. So I had buckets of blooms and nowhere to sell them. And that's when the bouquet bar was born. Making bouquets was taking me a long time. I'm a newbie at arranging flowers and I'm learning. So it was just taking me hours to make these bouquets. So I thought, what if I just harvested, got them ready, and then put the buckets on my porch, allow my customers to come to the porch and make their own bouquets. It's kind of like offering them an experience. It was truly a beautiful thing. I had customers coming from up to an hour away. I actually had one customer come from Massachusetts who was visiting family nearby and watches me on YouTube, thought she would stop in. So that was really fun to do. It was also a great interaction with the customer. And also, I've talked about this before, it was a marketing experiment. You're watching people choose the flowers and I'm seeing what they're choosing, what they're not choosing. And to be honest with you, something surprised me here. So customers were not choosing the coxcomb celosia out of the bucket, but when they asked me for help and I put that celosia into their bouquets, they thought it was amazing. So it really does give you market research to watch people make their own bouquets. The bouquet bar idea was not born into my farm until August and I was regretful of that because we had so much fun doing it and people were looking forward to doing it so much that this next year I'm really hoping to do that earlier, maybe even with my spring bulbs. So what's the solution here for the CSA? So this upcoming 2021 season for my CSA, I've split it in half. I have a first blooms and then a summer breeze option for my CSAs. They're both sold out. So the CSA members in the first round will be able to go from first blooms up until the middle of July and then the middle of July until first frost. So they'll be able to skip weeks in between, but they'll have fewer weeks to do so. I hope that's a happy medium. 
And if that's successful, I might even add a third option in 2022, a spring, a summer, and a fall. We'll see. Number four. Being prepared. This is a huge one on my list. And it's different than you might think. For much of the spring season, I found myself putting in 14 hour days, some of it in the field, some of it was my other commitments. I have a freelance job, I have a nine to five job, four days a week, I have two kids, and I have a lot of other things going on, plus I YouTube. So I was a very ill-prepared mother when it came to feeding my family, and that was something that really, it weighed me down. It made me feel a lot of mom guilt because I'm a person who always puts a home-cooked meal on the table. We don't do takeout. I don't order Chinese or pizza. Maybe once every couple of months we'll do that. But I don't do fast food. We are always having a home-cooked meal, and that's something I love to feed people. I joked in a couple of videos that I fed my kids cheese crackers for lunch, but that wasn't a joke. <laughs> that was real. They were eating cheese sticks and cheese crackers, and that's you know cereal for dinner some nights. It just, it's just the way that it was. I was so intent and purposeful on making this farm a success this year that everything else I had, bl I had blinders on. I had blinders, and I was so focused on doing that. And at the end of the day, I wouldn't be coming in the house till 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and. Uh, I would be like, hi family, and they're like, oh, who are you? And that's the reality of what it was like for me this season. So I'm spending several weekends this winter preparing for that spring season. So at least I can say that I fed my family. So the next two weekends, I believe, I'm gonna be making a bunch of crock pot meals and putting them in the freezer. That way, when I know I'm gonna have a long day in the field, I can just grab one of those meals out of the freezer, dump it in the crock pot, turn it on low, and by the time I'm ready to feed my family, all I have to do is come in and serve what the meal is or tell them, you know what, there's something in the crock pot. At least I'll have that off my shoulders. I do have to say that Brad Pitt steps in here and he's a master on the grill. So a lot of times he would do something quick on the grill and we'd just throw a bag of fries or something in the air fryer, which I'm not opposed to. I love that a couple nights a week, but sometimes you just need a home cooked meal. So I'm really gonna be focusing on making those crock pot meals happen so that I have enough time to spend out in the field and still feed my family. I think it's gonna be worth the sacrifice time in January, I really do pride myself on making home cooked meals just like my mom always did when I was a kid. So I think this is gonna be a bit of a relief for me come spring. So there's my solution. My solution is to make all these crock pot meals and get it ready. Crock pot meals. Number five, number five is a big one. The big one, the unexpected big one, a drought. We had a big old drought. We weren't severe but we had a severe drought. I don't care what anybody says. My hill had no water, no water for weeks, five, six weeks at a time. It was horrible. And I was not prepared for that. I could not be prepared for that because guess what? We have a well and guess whose well ran dry? Not once, not twice, but three times this year. I can't do irrigation and water my plants when I don't have any water. So what's a girl to do? Enter rain collection. Now rain collection was something, this idea was born because I had plants dying. I literally had plants dying in the ground. I mean, I was trying to cry over them so they would at least have a little bit of moisture. Didn't work, it's too salty. If you told me 2020 of all things would bring about a severe drought the same year I'm amping up my farm production, I would have laughed in your face, ha 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 ha. But it did, it brought me a drought, thanks. Not only did a lot of my seedlings die in the ground because they were just burning up in the heat, they didn't even germinate. A lot of the seeds that I put in the ground, my Bells of Ireland didn't germinate, my Larkspur didn't germinate, got a couple, two or three delphiniums, but not really. Enter the rain barrels, and this was a brainchild of Brad Pitt. Thanks, babe. How exactly do you collect rain when you're in a drought and you don't have any? <laughs> I don't know. We, we did have one night where it rained hard, and it was just coming down in buckets. And we're collecting rain from our entire roof over the garage. So all of that rain was coming down and we woke up in the morning and the tanks were almost full. It was incredible. So all of that square footage of the roof was coming down into the gutters and that gutter was connected to the rain barrels and they were on a trailer so they were portable. That was our solution and it worked like a charm. We were able to pull around the trailer with Brad's truck and we got a pump that plugged right into the electric into the back of the truck and I was able to hose that out. Perfect. We just didn't have that solution early enough in the season to save a lot of the plants that died. 
Also, my dahlias struggled real bad with drought after I planted them. It was just too late by the time we had that whole system rigged up for the dahlias. Plus, not to mention when I pulled all the dahlias up, most of them were diseased. Solution? Already told you, rain collection. Also, we've asked the man who originally drilled this well decades ago to come back and drill it even deeper to see if we can hit another pocket of water so that maybe we don't run out this year. That'd be good. Number six. I know a lot of you suffer from the same thing. Trying to do it all. This is probably the biggest mistake for me. No joke. All season long, you saw it, me, myself, and I, and Brad Pitt, trying to do it all. I started thousands and thousands of seedlings. I direct seeded thousands and thousands of seedlings. I planted hundreds and hundreds of dahlia tubers and bulbs, what have you, a wildflower field. I needed help. I killed more plants than I put into the ground tenfold. I'm not even kidding you. Trays and trays and trays of seedlings that just never made it into the ground because I didn't have time and I was, I don't know if I was too prideful or too embarrassed to ask for help. I desperately needed extra hands. Don't get me wrong, Brad Pitt and the kids are great helpers, but I can only ask so much of them. This is not their dream, it's mine. So my solution is to let someone help. I have a lot of friends who say, when can I help? When can I get my hands dirty? In exchange for flowers. <laughs> if that's not the best deal around, I don't know what is. And I'm also toying around with the possibility of maybe bringing on an intern from a local college or a high school in a conservation program, or even maybe hiring someone a few hours a week to help me at least weeding on the weekends. That would be an amazing help. So I'm definitely gonna be looking into doing that this year. I have to look into like hiring someone, what's that like? Do I have to have like workers comp and all that stuff? So I, I need to look in all that stuff, but at least I know I have some volunteers who are going to be willing to come and help me on the farm this year because I don't think I'll be able to do it if I don't have more hands. And that's just being honest. There are many more mistakes in my wheelhouse for 2020, but those are the ones that when I was thinking about it, those are the ones that came to mind and I thought those were the ones that I wanted to share with you guys and maybe something that you can learn from. What about you guys? Tell me your biggest mistakes right here in the comments and tell me what your solution to that is in 2021. I want to hear all, all of your mistakes. Who knows? Maybe you'll help someone who is reading the comments. Maybe you'll help them in the upcoming year. I can't wait to hear all your mistakes so I don't feel so bad. See you soon.